So if you have your Bibles or devices, you can go and open them up. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And while you guys are turning, as you guys are getting there, let me go and just ask kind of a, a general question. Let me see. If you, off the top of your head, if you could list, what is, what is one thing in this world that you could not live without? Right? It's that kind of general icebreaker question. If you were stuck on a deserted island, you are alone, there's nothing else, there's nobody else, what is one thing that you have to have? You said clean water? That's a good one. Yeah. A life straw? Uh, same boat, like clean water, you know, water to drink. Fire. All right, all right. I see a lot of us have gone more the, more the practical route, and that's, that's fair. I think um, a lot of research that I'd shown, a lot of just lists that I went over, a lot of them went super practical like you guys did, right? I saw some that said, like, oh, I should get a flare because, like, you know, if the boat approaches, I need some way to signal them that, like, hey, come get me. Like, I am on a deserted island. Come save me. I saw some people putting things like lighters. Again, y'all had mentioned fire. So again, some way to produce fire for heat, fire, again, probably for signaling boats and stuff like that as well. Other people kind of went more into the arts and they were like, well, I'd bring my guitar or I'd bring some kind of instrument so that I could not go crazy, right? I can entertain myself, keep myself occupied. All things considered, they, they had other super practical things, although I don't know if I would agree like this is the one thing, but people were like, I have to have toilet paper. I guess I shouldn't be that surprised, being that, you know, last time through the pandemic, we bought all the toilet paper for whatever reason. It didn't quite make a lot of sense then. I don't think it makes a lot of sense now. People are like insect repellent, which is fair. I mean, malaria could basically kill you if you're stuck on an island. People said sunscreen, which I guess, you know, Gotta have fair skin while you're deserted on the island, you know, it's not a bad thing to go for. My personal favorite though, because I, I, don't, want, I don't want to be like, this person's stupid, like I just, I can't understand. If you're on a deserted island by yourself, why did somebody write volleyball? Like I don't, why, are you going to play on your own? Like uh, the best you could do is maybe bump set spike and then you go get it, you know? Like I don't, I don't really understand the thought process behind somebody saying like, I want a volleyball, but somebody did. But essentially, again, the question that we're trying to dive into here is, is probably like, what is the most important thing to you? Right? What is the one thing in this world that you value most? And what's funny is that of all the answers, of all the research that I found, nobody put money. Like, nobody put money. They, again, somebody thought to put volleyball before somebody put down money as something that they wanted on a deserted island. See, we're continuing in this series just called Jesus versus the World, right? We've been looking at this idea of, of what it means to look at the things, the words, the sayings, the wisdoms of our world, and then comparing that to what Jesus has taught us. Right, we're comparing that to the words and the teachings and the truth that we have in Jesus. And I mentioned even that one because that's what we started with last week. We looked at this idea of what does it mean to live your truth, as our world would say. You go live your truth, you be your truth, you go find your truth. Versus Jesus coming and saying, I am the truth. Right, we saw that it might be kind, it might be nice to be like, hey, you can go live your truth. But the most loving thing that we can do as Christians is to tell them that, hey, you might have a truth that you listen to, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to go to the Father is through Him. And so today, I want to transition us to a different topic, one of greed. Right? Curtis Jackson, a.k.a. 50 Cent, said that you should get rich or die trying. Right? He even made a movie about it and everything like that. But at the same time, aside from just his own sayings and just his own things, you have all these other sayings that people go for, right? You need to get your bag. You need to go make that money. You need to make bank. You need to make it rain. However you want to phrase it, we have all these colloquial ways of saying, you know what's important is that you need to go make money. I don't think I have to convince you that much to say that our world focuses a lot on the money that we make. The number one reason why people are trying to still come into America, well, be it that there are lots of reasons, but the number one reason why people are still trying to make their way here is because they desire better economic situations than the ones that they're coming from. Even us as Americans who are here, according to Stash, which is a financial and investment firm, the number one concern of Americans today is building up economic wealth. That despite that there's multiple wars, 
The Israel-Hamas war that's going on, the Russia-Ukraine war that's going on, the presidential election that's happening in this year, all these other things considered, they're still like, nope, like the number one thing that I'm most concerned about is, is making money. I think the question that arises from this answer though, from this idea of building wealth is, well, how much is enough? Like how much money is really enough money? And I think what best sums up this idea is something that comes from John D. Rockefeller. For those who need a history refresher, like I did myself, John D. Rockefeller was the founder of Standard Oil Company, and he dominated the markets back in the 1800s. By 1882, Rockefeller controlled 90% of oil refineries. All right, by 1937, when Rockefeller died, his total assets equated to about 1.5% of America's total GDP. By those numbers, if we adjusted that for today, if somebody in today's standards owned 1.5% of the GDP, that would make them richer than the top 10 richest billionaires in our world. Take the top 10 richest people in our world, and they still don't have as much money as Rockefeller did back in his time. And it's not even close. He was a multi-trillionaire by our day and age right now. As of right now, Elon Musk is the richest person at 200-something billion. Rockefeller was a trillionaire by our standards. Like, it's not even, it's so funny, it's not even close how much money that he had. And I bring all this up because there was a reporter who towards the end of his life, after he had accomplished all his goals, after he had accomplished many of the things that he wanted to, the reporter asked him, Rockefeller, like, how much more money do you want? And he still said, just a little bit more. And I say that because this chart here represents what our economic desires are that it shows how much money do you think you want to be happy. And if you notice this green line that continues to go down, every time you reach into the next bracket, that thing just goes up just a little bit more. Then maybe you're earning 50K and you're like, you know what, I would, I would be really happy at 75. And then you look at the people in 75 and they're like, you know what, I would be really happy if I had 100. And it just goes on and on and on. It's this idea of just, just a little bit more. I just want a little bit more money. And so I think it very much fits the phrasing of 50 Cent when he says, get rich or die trying. This is what we're doing right now. This is what we're living in. This is what our world is saying that the way we should operate. You either get rich or you die trying. You continue seeking after that next step, that next amount more that will make you happy. And as you continue getting there, you just come up a little bit short. You want just a little bit more. And so with that, that's what the world argues for. That's what the world is petitioning us towards. That's what the world is saying that we should go for, we should strive for, we should achieve. And so now I want to compare that. What does Jesus say when it comes to greed and wealth? What does Jesus advocate should, borrow, should be our outlook when it comes to money, when it comes to greed, when it comes to the things of this world? So with that, again, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And so it reads for us here. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then, the light is, if, if then if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So I think the first thing that I want to point out is that Jesus tells us here is that we cannot have greedy hearts. Right? That our hearts cannot be greedy for what this world has to offer. See, in verse 19, Jesus tells us how temporary our treasures are here. And he tells us, essentially, pointing out to these things, that everything we have on this earth is going to go away at some point or another. Again, he phrases it with moth and rust. Again, at that time, uh, the, the highest value of items would have been like fine silks and fine cloth, which, again, moth larvae, more particularly than moth, they would eat and they would destroy. Or again, even if you had gold and other fancy metals, again, rust would eventually, again, eat away at them. That's actually what the, the word destroy is to, to eat away at, essentially. And then even if you said, like, well, the, the, the metals that I have are so precious, they won't be destroyed by those means, then Jesus says, well, okay, thieves will come in and break in and steal these things away. 
That Jesus is pointing out to us here that the things of this world are temporary. No matter how hard you work, no matter how much you strive to keep it, no matter how much you do, eventually everything on this earth will go away. I mean, again, even reflecting back on their days, which, again, even comes into ours. Think back to the Egyptians, right? Their main, like, what we see of them most now is we see these pyramids that these pharaohs were building, these monuments to their death, and inside of their pyramids, they sort of all of these treasures, all of these golds, all of these things that they had. And all of this they had up there, and they still showed that to this day, you can go and we can find those pyramids. We can see these monuments that they built. And guess what? The gold's still in there. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't go with them to the next life. It's on display on museums right now. In fact, here in Houston, as of right now, you can go to the Museum of Natural Science and you can go check out King Tut's tomb. Right? All the things that he strived for, all the things that he worked for, are still on display right now for us. So instead, Jesus says, instead of building up these things here on earth, no, what you do is you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Right? That's what he tells us in verse 20. The main question that I always feel that comes up with this when we say, well, build up treasures in heaven is, is how? Right? How do we build up treasures in heaven? See, what tra while treasures in heaven could technically include tithing and things of that nature, like we talked about earlier in our service, where we have that opportunity for us to give, at the same time, that's, that's just a fraction. That's just one part of it. There are many, many more ways that we can, boo we can build up treasures in heaven. See, this section of scripture here in Matthew 6, this is in the middle of, of a famous message that Jesus has given. One of the longest messages that he gives. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus gave it at the base of the mountain. Again, Christian terms, we are not very fancy in how we name things. Again, I mentioned last week, the upper room discourse was called the upper room discourse because it was held in an upper room of a house. The Sermon on the Mount is called the Sermon on the Mount because he gave a sermon on the mountain. Not rocket science. Remember, it's very simple how we like to name things, okay? Then there's another one, the Olive Discourse. Guess where it took place in? The Olive Garden. Again, case in point. But So anyway, this, this idea that Jesus said in this uh, message that he gave, he gave multiple ways that you could see building up treasures in heaven. In chapter 5, or earlier, uh, in the, the chapter right before, when he began the message, he said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. In other words, he's saying that storing up treasures in heaven is standing firm in your faith. That when people come against you, when people persecute you, when they ridicule you, when they make fun of you, they're like, you believe in that? Like, that's, that's what you're basing your life on? It's when you stand firm in your faith. When you don't compromise on the gospel, when you continue to believe in who Jesus Christ is and was and is, regardless of the consequences of everything else going on, when you continue to hold firm in your faith, you are building up, you are storing treasures in heaven. In that same chapter, in verse 44, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Then not only are you to store up treasures by standing firm in your faith, but those people who are making fun of you, those people who are persecuting you, you pray for them. You love them. That you build up treasures for yourself in heaven when you continue to show the love of God to those, even those who persecute you, even those who are your enemies. And the third one he lists in this message is at the beginning of chapter 6, in 6.6, 6, when he says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And the Father sees you in secret and rewards you. Right, that we don't use our faith as something for public display. That it's not, look at me, how, how wonderful am I? How great am I that I get to pray to such a great God? You don't use your faith to elevate you. You use your faith to elevate God. Looking at these examples, the same message comes across. All across the New Testament, you'll find multiple ways that you can build up treasures in heaven. And looking through all these things, there's one kind of common theme that kind of comes across it. Right? It's about your heart. It's about your contentment in the situation. It's about giving God the glory that he deserves. It's about knowing and recognizing what you value most. Because what he says here at the end in 21, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when you recognize that the most important things in life aren't the things that you have, but it's your relationship, it's your devotion, it's your trust and who Jesus Christ is. That's when you store up treasures in heaven. That's when you see those things built up for your future home. See, what Jesus is saying here is that it's not about what you have or don't have. Again, it's about your priorities. 
Do you prioritize the things you have here on earth? Or again, do you prioritize God? Do you value the things you have in the room next door to you? Or do you value relationship with God? If our hearts are greedy, if we seek after the things here on earth, we continue to seek after the things here in a place that is temporary. We continue to see that those will always fail us. And that our hearts should not be greedy for the things of this world, but again, should be pointed forward to the kingdom ahead. Because the things here on this earth, when we value them and we trust in them, those things own us. Great quote from Albert Schweitzer. He said, anything you have that you cannot give away, you do not really own, it owns you. And so looking towards that, again, it's this idea that our building up treasures in heaven, serving God despite the consequences, loving others despite what they've done to us, and trusting and glorifying God because he is worthy of our praise. Those are things that we do to store up treasures in heaven, to turn our hearts away from being greedy here on earth and being hearts pointed towards God. And so the second thing that Jesus points us here in this passage when he tells us when it comes to wealth is that we cannot have greedy eyes. Now, when reading through verse 22 and 23, initially it's kind of like, it seems like it took a hard left turn. Like, I don't really get how this relates to wealth and how this relates to greed. He's talking about the eye and light and darkness, and you're kind of like, this doesn't seem like it fits. Like, a lot of times in your Bibles, you may actually have these subdivided. You have uh, the first section a while ago, 19 through 21, then there's a gap then 22, 23, then there's a gap, and then 24. Because a lot of people even associate that this is like a sandwich. Like the top two kind of go together, but this middle section seems kind of different. But the reason why it seems so different is because we don't speak Hebrew, right? I don't speak Hebrew, but I read commentaries that tell me about Hebrew. So let me fill you in on what some of the commentaries about the Hebrew language really show us here. See, Jesus making this reference towards having good eyes or having bad eyes. This doesn't make sense to us, but this is a Hebrew idiom. Again, idioms are those things that that you say with non-literal meanings, right? That if I were to come to you and be like, I I feel under the weather. You're not like, he's under a cloud. Like, it's not literal. Like, I'm not literally under the weather. You recognize it means like, oh, that means that I'm feeling sick. Right? And so, in the Hebrew phrasing, when they say that you have a good eye or a bad eye, it's it's referencing your generosity. And somebody with a good eye was somebody who was generous. I don't know if I have another slide in between. Okay, I skipped. I don't know if I I thought I had this, but maybe not. I might have not put up a slide that I meant to. So, nonetheless, I'll just leave this here. But in Proverbs 22, uh, 22, 9, it says, Whoever has a bountiful eye, the good eye, essentially, they are blessed because they share in their generosity. But that whoever has this good eye will share and be generous with those around you. And at the same time, somebody who has a bad eye is stingy. That's what it says in Proverbs 28, 22. So those with stinginess are eager to get rich because they'll hold on to what they have. And that word stinginess could also be translated, again, as bad eyes. But for our English translations, they just translate, they, they, they transliterate that because to say those who have bad eyes wouldn't make as much sense to us. So they say those who are stingy, those who are evil, those who are, again, who have bad eyes, they hold on to what they have. So Jesus is saying that this eye that we have is the lamp to the body. It is the thing that shows your heart. That if your eye is good and healthy, your body will be full of light. And conversely, if your eye is bad, then you will be filled with darkness. And light and darkness through the whole Bible has always been kind of this reference theme that represents God as holy and and light-filled. And darkness being something that represents evil and sin. So for us to have good eyes, as Christ is advocating for us to have, is to have eyes like God, to have eyes that are generous like God. Having the right eyes gives you the right frame of reference, gives you the right way to look at things. And so, I don't know if you guys realize, each and every one of us, we have a good eye and we have a bad eye. In our way that we say it now, we say that one of our eyes is dominant and one of them is less dominant. So I have a way that I can test this for you. Okay, I put this blue circle up. If you take your hands, you can make a little window. You can do this right now if you want. You can figure out which is your good eye, which is your bad eye. I, I can't really do this with the suit on as much, but fully extend your arms and put the, take your little window and put your dot inside it. Make sure it's centered as you're looking. Both eyes open, look at the dot. Make sure the dot's inside your window, right? And then choose one eye. Let's just say everybody choose your right eye. Close your right eye. If that dot is still in the center, that means your left eye is dominant. So try closing your left eye. Did that dot move or did that dot come back into the center? 
If the dot is now in the center, that means, again, if you have your left eye closed, your right eye is your dominant eye. You can go back and forth if you need to try. Again, one eye open should have the dot in the middle. In the middle. In the middle. Whichever eye that you have open that's in the middle, that is your dominant eye. <laughs> In general, it's supposed to work, but hopefully you can figure out, if not, we can go after, that's what Sunday school is for, right? We can go in and we can figure out what's your dominant eye, right? But essentially, again, if, if you notice it, if it works the way that it's supposed to, if this works out the way that it's supposed to, when you're looking in and your dominant eye is open, that the hole is in the, 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 the dot is in the center of your window, right? And when you open your less dominant eye, the dot moves, it's out of alignment, it is no longer centered within your hands. Again, I think this is the same sentiment that Christ has for us. That when Jesus is telling us here that we need to have good eyes, that we need to see the way that God wants us to see, that we need to be generous as God wants us to be generous, that when we have good eyes, when we use our dominant eye, when we use our good eye, we are seeing things the way that God wants us to see. When we use our bad eye, when we look at a way that is not generous, that does not align with who and what God is then everything shifts off focus. Things get out of alignment. That we shouldn't be, again, working in a way that stores up treasures for ourselves. But no, but we should be generous. We should be gracious towards others. That we should serve and, and do things in a way that brings glory to God. That would be working in a way that has good eyes. It's in alignment with who God is and what God wants for us. So that's what Jesus talks about here, and that's what he means by having a good eye and a bad eye, that it's to have alignment with who God is and what God wants for us. It's not to have greedy eyes, to have bad eyes, to have evil eyes, but continue to strive to have eyes like God. And so finally, the last thing that Jesus brings into here about wealth is that we cannot be greedy servants. And really the question that he drives to us here is, is really asking, who is our master? Right? Are we good servants trying to serve God? Or are we trying to strive for double duty and serve God and money? See, Jesus' argument is, so far is that, again, if we're committed to following Christ, if we're a person who says that we want to make Jesus our Lord and Savior, then he says our desire isn't for the things of this world, it is to store up treasures in heaven. That we are to serve God for his glory. That we want to make the right choice and, and do those things out of pure devotion to God. That we seek to see, again, with good eyes, as God has seen. That he is generous, and we seek to be generous like him. And so here, Jesus, in verse 24, he concludes, and he says, Nobody serves two masters. Right? That there is no way that you can do both of these things at the same time. There is no way that you can seek treasures on earth and seek treasures in heaven. That there is no way that you can see both with a good eye and with a bad eye, and everything lines up perfectly. So Jesus equates this to servanthood, that no one can have two masters, that if they try to serve two masters, no matter what happens, conflict will arise. Again, he says, maybe one is more devoted to the other, or maybe one of the masters gives a ruling that the, the other one cannot, he cannot follow both of those. If both of them say, like, hey, I need you here at 9 a.m., then the servant cannot be like, I'll be there for both of y'all at 9 a.m. He has to choose one or the other. Or perhaps, again, he, he finds that he aligns more with his beliefs with one master than the other. So eventually, again, he starts to love one master more than he loves the other. But take note of what Jesus is talking about here in terms of this reference of serving money or serving God. Jesus isn't condemning us for having money. He isn't saying that you cannot have money. He's not telling us that you can't be rich, that, that being a follower of Christ means that we now need to take a vow of poverty and just go give all that we have, that all of that needs to go to other people and you, you cannot have nice things. Right? That you're sinful if you take a vacation because that's, that's spending money that you should be giving away, that that's not the right way of doing things. That if you own a Tesla, it doesn't mean that you're just conserving energy, that you're conserving sin. Right? That's not what Jesus is getting at here. Jesus taught us that money itself isn't the root of all evil, but it's the love of money. It's the desires, it's the covetousness of money that is the root of all evil. Jesus is telling us that as followers of Christ, money is just another tool for the glory of God. See, John Wesley was a theologian back in the 1700s. His work and preaching eventually created what we now know as the Methodist denomination. And John Wesley lived with three financial principles. He always said that you earn as much as you possibly can, that you save as much as you possibly can, 
And you do those first two so that you can give to God's glory as much as you can. So strive to earn, strive to save, and strive to give. I think with all of those three principles, if we can live those things out, if we can continue to keep God as the highest priority, if we can continue to serve God as our master rather than money, I think that's what Jesus is trying to teach us here and Jesus is trying to to hint towards us that we can choose either God or money. We can choose to serve one of those, but eventually those priorities will always come to a conflict and we have the choice to serve God and we hope and I pray that you choose wisely. And so as we finish off this message here this morning, you might be asking, why? Like, why should I choose God instead of money? And to be fair, that's, that's a good question, right? Taking myself out of this a little bit, saying this is not from a pastoral or, or a ministerial type of position. If you just take all the gospel sense out of it, that's, that's a good question. It's a good question to have of why should I devote myself to God? I think the answer to that always comes back to the cross, And when we look at God, the reason why we serve God, the reason why we give everything that we are for His glory is because God was already so generous in giving us Christ. God was so rich in His grace that He recognized us and our fallen nature. That He saw us as the sinners that we are. And He chose to find a way to make us whole. He chose to find a way to make us perfect. And He did so through Jesus Christ on the cross. And he sent his son who lived the perfect life, who did everything exactly the way that God wanted. That he took his son and he put him on trial so that he would be killed and ultimately resurrected, that he would defeat the grave, all for the purpose of our reuniting with God the Father. When we place our faith and our trust in him, We are given this opportunity to be with God for all eternity. And it's important to take note of that because it's not about how much money that you make. It's not about how much money you give away. It's not because of how good of a life that you've lived or how poor of a life that you may have lived. How many poor choices that you've made. We are given this opportunity to spend all eternity with God in heaven because he gave us Christ. I think that's the reason why we choose God over everything else over anything else. It's in response to God that I and here and or I here and many others have chosen to devote our lives to bringing glory to God's name. You have chosen again to make God our master over anything else. And so for you here if you're wondering about this decision, if you're wondering about what that might look like, I challenge you just to take one step today. To take one step forward in a relationship with Christ. And maybe that one step might be opening up your Bible, going online, finding an online Bible, whatever it may be, and just reading through a gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read through the life of Jesus. Maybe that's just your first step. You don't have to have a conversation with anybody. You don't have to do anything in particular. Just on your own, just read through the gospel and see the life of Christ and see what he has done for you. Maybe that step for you is coming out to talk to someone. That you've read through the Gospels, you have questions, you have things that you're wanting answers towards. Find somebody here. Everybody here that, it would be more, most everybody here will be more than happy to have a conversation with you about what a life devoted to Christ looks like. Take that one step with Christ today. And I can promise you that here at West Houston, I would love nothing more than to spend time with you, to celebrate that, to pray with you, to walk with you. And just to see again how God wants to use us for his glory. And for those of you who have already made that decision in your life, then take this moment today just to reevaluate where you are. To take stock of what you're valuing in life. To check, am I looking at this world through the good eye that God has given me? Through the good eye that God wants me to have? Through the eye that God has? Or again, have I lost sight? Have I been misaligned? Have I strayed away? Take this moment to see, where am I putting my money? Where am I spending things? Take a look and see, how am I spending my time? Where am I devoting myself to? And maybe this message here is is a wake-up call for you to realize that maybe I have strayed away. Maybe I have stirred off. And this is the wake-up call that you need to get in alignment with Christ. To see Him, to glorify Him, and to give Him the priority and the praise that He deserves. Let this moment be self-reflection And this moment that you can take your relationship with Jesus to the next level. 
How can I redirect my focus towards God? Or even, how can I take time to make his name known? Because ultimately, that is the purpose of what each and every one of us is called here for, is to give God the glory to continue to share his name and make his name known, to know him and to make him known, that he may increase while I decrease. And again, the continual mission of us here at West Houston is to grow our hearts for Jesus, to continue to grow in our devotion to him, to see him in, in everything that we do, to grow our hearts for him, to grow his hearts, to grow our hearts for his people, for the people around us here in this building, that we grow in fellowship, that we grow in community, that we grow deeper in relationship with one another. And then we take this love, we take this glory that we have been given and we send it out to the world, that we love the people in this world that God has placed us in, that we continue to seek to make known the name of God in every place that we're at. And so I hope that mission that we have here is the mission that you have in your hearts. I hope that that alignment fits within yours, because if not, then maybe this isn't the right church for you, and that's okay. You need to find a church where God has placed you, where God has loved you, and God wants the best for you ultimately to bring his name glory. And so this is our mission here at West Houston. This is what we have been placed on this earth, specifically here at 1907, Derry Ashford. That is why this building exists, so that we can love him, to grow in our affections for him, to grow in our affections for each other, and ultimately to grow in our love for this world. So I hope and I pray that that be your mission here on earth, and that be, again, what drives you and what motivates you and what allows you, again, just to see the love of God in everything that we do. So with that, let me pray for us, and we'll continue to respond in song here this morning. Father, again, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we have this opportunity, that we can come before you, that we can enter into your house with thanksgiving and praise. And God, we know that this is, again, an opportunity that we have to give you glory. And we just pray, God, that we take this time give you the praise that you deserve, to put things aside, to put our eyes, our focus on you and only on you. Then we take this opportunity again to, to see who it is that you've created us to be, that you have shaped each and every one of us, you have molded us, you have created us into the person that we are. And God, we just pray that you would just help us realign ourselves to you to your desires, to your glory, to your goodness. So God, we pray that as we respond here in song, again, let these words resonate within us. Let this, again, just not be notes that we sing, not these words that we just recite, but again, let them continue to to dwell within us, to see your glory, to respond, again, to the sacrifice of your Son on the cross. And God, we pray that we let your Holy Spirit, again, just dwell within us to continue to follow it more than we follow ourselves, to follow it more than we follow the world, to continue to see that your ways are greater than ours. And so, God, we thank you for this opportunity. We praise you for this time that we have, and we glorify you with everything that we are. We do these and pray these all in Jesus' name. Amen.